Greetings, brethren, and welcome to this Sabbath for the 18th day of the 10th month on God's holy sacred calendar. It's the 21st day of December 2013 on the pagan Roman calendar. And where you might think there's 10 days left till the end of the year, well, that's only on the pagan calendar, on the real calendar, the calendar of the future, the calendar that will be used during the millennium coming soon to an earth near you. The real calendar has a good couple months to go before the new year begins. We've got all of the rest of the 10th month and all of the 11th month, all of the 12th month. Then the real new year begins and begins in the springtime when things begin, when there's a new beginning. Well, friends, today I have uh, a funeral than I need to attend. I just came back from a viewing, so I'm going to be brief with the subject I have for you today. I promised I'd cover some questions, the answers to some questions such as who and what are Arabs, Muslims, and Islam? Uh, clearing the, uh, today I'll kind of clear the Muslim mishmash, so to speak, or at least in an introductory way be asking, answering some questions. Who is the king of the south and the king of the north? You know, over 100 million people in the world call themselves Arabs. Now, what is an Arab? <clears throat> an Arab is defined secularly as those who speak Arabic as their native tongue and who identify themselves as Arabs. That's a definition you can find on the internet. The Arab world is distinguished from the Middle East. The Middle East, which has a descriptive designation of an area, includes such non-Arab countries as Israel, Iran, Turkey, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. The term Middle East was coined or, or came into existence during the heyday of the British Commonwealth as an empire ruling over many countries and peoples. How does the Arab world relate to the term Muslim? Although, you know, I don't mean the Arab world as a people, but I mean, how does the term Arab, you know, relate to the term Muslim? Although Arab history is closely associated with Muslim history, there are distinctions between the two terms that I hope to clear up with the following facts. A Muslim is a person who has adopted Islam as his religion. Maybe he grew up with it, and maybe the adoption to it was simply, well, this is what my parents did. But in any event, a Muslim is associated with the Islamic religion. One is a person. The Muslim is a person. Islam is an, a thing, is a religion. We'll explain the Islam religion and how and when it came into existence in a future talk. But I may make some mention of that today with a, as I go into a little further clarification of what and who is a Muslim. Is a Muslim to Islam the same thing as a Jew is to Judaism, to, to the Jewish religion? A Jew is someone born of the tribe or family of Judah, an offspring of Judah. The Levites of the tribe of Levi and the Benjamites of the tribe or family of Benjamin associated themselves with Judah in such a way that they are included in, in the expressions, the house of Judah. Some people become known as a Jew by becoming a proselyte, but a Jew in, this, in the strictest sense of the word is one who is born of the family or tribe of Judah, one who actually has Jewish blood, you could put it. The religion of someone born of the tribe of Judah normally, normally now is Judaism, those who observe the Jewish religion. Is the same type of thing true of an Arab? In a limited sense, where does the word Arab come from? 
is it not part of the geographical designation known as Saudi Arabia or Saudi Arabia as some pronounce it? The word Arab is built right into that geographical designation. Let's go back again to Abraham. It's no secret of history, even secular history, that Abraham fathered the illegitimate child with Sarah's handmaid, Hagar. The son who was born 14 years before Isaac was born was named Ishmael. God promised Ishmael's mother, Hagar, that he, God, would make Ishmael a great nation. Now, God honored the family. God honored the illegitimate son and made him honorable in a way. And yet he's still a wild man, and we'll discuss that a little bit as we get into our talk here. You can read, though, about how God promised to make Israel, Israel a great nation in G Genesis 17, verse 20, where God also says both that he'll make Ishmael, Ishmael a great nation and specifically that 12 princes, 12 rulers, 12 sheiks, like the sheik of Arabic, and, uh, and, and there in that name, of sheik of Arabic, is, is Arab. Now, that's just a side point, not the main point I'll be driving us to in a moment. But God makes the promise to Hagar in Genesis 17 and then repeats it again in Genesis 21, verse 18, where God promises to Hagar as she held Ishmael in her arms and lifted him up before God for the blessing. And God provided a well of water there in the desert wilderness of Paran where the lad grew up becoming a great desert hunter with his archer and archery. He later married an Egyptian gal, as God tells us, through Moses in Genesis 21:21. 21, 21. Uh, God elaborates more on Ishmael and the 12 princes in Genesis 25, beginning at verse 16. I cannot take the time to go through those verses today because of a funeral I plan on attending. <clears throat> Uh, today, and as I mentioned at the opening, I think I mentioned at the opening, if I didn't, I meant to tell you that I just came from a viewing and that I'm going to have to leave for a funeral uh, in, in a few moments from now, a few minutes from now, a funeral that <clears throat> honors a longtime member of the body of Christ for, <clears throat> for these latter days, a brother who became a member of the Birmingham, Alabama congregation in the late 50s or early 60s. <clears throat> Excuse me, friends. When Hagar was in the wilderness of Paran raising Ishmael where, uh, where they were in a geographical designation that we can recognize easily today, as 1 Kings 11.18 shows, the wilderness of Paran is adjacent to the land of Midian, which is today known as the modern Al-Bad in North Saudi Arabia. So, geographically speaking, here now is your Arab connection. Through Saudi Arabia, or Saudi Arabia, land of the Arab people, the land that became associated with Hagar and Ishmael, from which Ishmael's descendants, who became the 12 princes or sheiks of Arabic, or Arabic descent, and they spread all around from there. And where did those 12 princes go from there? Brethren and friends, the, the Bible is the foundation of all knowledge. Secular history tries to tell us that there are significant non-Muslim Arab communities, and most Mus Muslims are, in fact, from large non-Arab countries, such as Turkey, Pakistan, Indonesia, and many of the countries of sub uh, saharan Africa. There are also large Arab and non-Arab Muslim communities in North America. The Bible clears this up so that we can discern what's up. Just as the people of the house of Judah, known as the Jews today, became scattered around the world and mixed in among 
all the other tribes of Israel and among the other Gentile nations of the world, as God said they would. Let's look at Jeremiah 40, verse 15, which is the first place in the Bible where God begins to introduce the idea expressly through Jeremiah that Judah could become scattered. God, through Jeremiah, says, says, Jeremiah 40, verse 15, Then Yohanan, the son of Korea, spake to Gedaliah and Mizpaz, secretly saying, Let me go, I pray you, and I will slay Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, uh, and no man shall know it. Wherefore should he slay you? that all the Jews which are gathered unto thee should be scattered, and the name and the remnant in Judah perish. And now that Ishmael was not the same Ishmael, as it said it was a, his father was another father. But the point is about the scattering. God <clears throat> mentions through Jeremiah about the potential of scattering. And in Zechari Zechariah 1, God records the actual happening of a scattering of Judah. In verses 19 and 21 we read, And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah and Israel and Jerusalem. Verse 21, Then said I, What come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah, to scatter it. Brethren, friends, today, except for a few gathered and living in the little nation of Israel in the Middle East, a geographical area that's just barely bigger than in size than the state of New Jersey, the fifth smallest U.S. state, the Greek word dis diaspora, diaspora, referring to the Jews, is a transliteration of a Greek word that means to sow throughout, to scatter. And so God sowed Judah throughout all the world among all the nations of the earth. Let's see a certain similarity with Ishmael that explains why people get confused about who and what the Arabs are. The definition of an Arab that I, I read to you a few moments ago in my talk here today that that could leave the understanding somewhat wanting or weak, says the Arabs are those who speak Arabic as their native tongue and who identify themselves as Arabs. Now, now in that definition, native tongue prevents that from including any of you who might say, well, I'll just run out and learn the, the Arabic language and call myself an Arab. Well, the language... Uh, were that not were it not your native tongue, the 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 tongue you learned from your parents from from birth, just learning Arabic later in life would not make you an Arab even under that secular definition of an Arab because of it requiring that it be your native tongue. Now it seems when you study it that a people known as the Arabs lived before Ishmael was born, and although a people known as the Hebrews from Heber lived before Judah was born, and all Hebrews are not Jews, but all Jews, ethnically speaking, are Hebrews, and in spite of the fact that there may be a small number of people who descended from Heber today who are not Jews or who are not of other tribes of Israel. Nonetheless, the term the Hebrews is often used today to refer to the people of the 12 tribes of Israel. Technically speaking, though, once Ishmael, since, since, since Ishmael is of the loins of Abraham, Ishmael is a Hebrew too, in one technical sense. Brethren, friends, you see why adultery is not a good thing. It, it can really cause all kind of confusion. But God used Ishmael for a purpose that we see 
uh, before us in our faces even today. Let's read Genesis 16, verse 12, and I'll read it again in a moment too. And he, Ishmael, will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's, man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Brethren, friends, I will acknowledge here the technical argument and understanding that not all Arabs are Ishmaelites, uh, like not all Hebrews are Israelites. The point here being that technically it doesn't necessarily hold that all Ishmaelites are Arabs under one definition. The Bible tells us that Ishmael's mother was an Egyptian, an Egyptian handmaid a handmaid from Egypt, and Ishmael married an Egyptian gal. From there, through Ishmael's dis uh, from there, though Ishmael's descendants were born in an area in Saudi Arabia in the wilderness of Paran, and that somewhere and, and that was somewhere near Mecca. I'm still working on putting this together in a way that's easy to explain and easy to understand. I plan on going over and reading a little bit to you from parts of a couple of older Plain Truth articles in a future talk on the Sabbath, or maybe even on NICAST, that, that you might want to look at ahead of time. One is called The Arab World in Prophecy from the December 1979 Plain Truth, and the other article is entitled Seeing the World Through Islamic Eyes from the December 1980 plain truth. Brethren, to get our heads screwed on straight about this subject, we always should go back to the foundation of all knowledge, God's Word, the Bible, and review what God has taught to us through his end-time apostle Herbert W. Armstrong, and I'm still going back through other articles to share what I find there with you. And I'm open to sharing, your sharing with me what you find from such articles that, that you might find that you think I've missed or am missing. My email is on the Contact Us page uh, on, our, on our website, cogtv.org, or on, also you'll find it, a link to that from the night-cast.tv website. And from the website we're using today, the SabbathService.tv website, you'll find a contact us tab. You can get my email if you want to write me with any of these things. But God says through Moses in Genesis 16, verse 12, referring to Ishmael, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Brethren, friends, his dwelling in the presence of all his brethren means we will find Ishmael scattered even into areas that are not considered uh, Arabian communities, such as having dwelling places in Turkey, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, and in many of the countries of of Africa and the large Arab and Muslim communities in North America. A peculiar and primate characteristics of the Arabs is their professed desire for unity, but their inability to maintain it. The Economist in 1988 described the Arabs as a world against itself. That disunity has prevented them from developing sufficient strength to oust the Jews from Israel, a desire which until recently was fervently held. The Arab nations tried in 1948, 1956, 1967 and 1973 to destroy Israel. Their intentions 
were in complete accord with the prophecy of Psalm 83, uh, Psalm 83, which describes the largely Islamic peoples who live in the territories known today as Jordan, Lebanon, the Gaza Strip, Iraq, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. Verse 4 of Psalm 83 says, They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Again, that's from Psalm 83, verse 4. Brethren and friends, I'll be covering more on this in the weeks ahead here on the Sabbath Service Channel and also in the Nightcast program on the Nightcast Channel. I may try to branch off into some of these things as I learn more about this exciting and interesting history that is becoming very alive again in our daily news. Just this year in September, an event in the news related to this is something I should probably stop now and remind you of here. Uh, now, I don't have a photograph to show you, but uh, in September this year, on September 22nd, it was during the fourth day of the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel, this year, 2013, at the cave of Mac Machpelah, where Abraham is buried. Uh, now, before I remind you of what happened in September this year, let's review what happened at this same place, at the tomb of Abraham, at the cave of Machpelah in Israel. What happened there in 1994? Now, the cave of Machpelah is in the city of Hebron in Israel. The This famous burial place, sometimes infamous burial place, but very popular place. I went there just uh, some years ago during the Feast of Tabernacles, and this site where Abraham is believed to be buried along with Sarah and Isaac and Jacob uh, is known to many as the tomb of the patriarchs in the city of Hebron where it's located uh, there are approximately 200,000 Arabs living there. And uh, in the old city of Hebron, there are 7,000 Israelis living in a highly uh, high security part of Hebron's old city. The tomb of the patriarch has been divided by uh, a pane of bulletproof glass to allow each religious community, Christians, Jews, Muslims, to pray at the tomb of Abraham separately and yet at the same time. The Vatican insider of September 23, 2013, tells us that Hebron's, Hebron's history is a perfect illustration of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The tomb of patriarchs occupies a hugely important place in Jewish history. As the book of Genesis says, the cave of Machpelah was purchased by Abraham. The, the man tried to give it to him as a gift, but Abraham insisted, nope, 400 shekels of silver, and he, he bought it and paid for it to use as a burial plot for his wife Sarah before his own death. For this reason, it is considered the earliest evidence of the promised land. A small community of Jews continued to live there alongside Muslims even during the diaspora. This was until the 1929 pogrom when 67 Jews from Hebron were brutally killed in the early clashes between Arab nationalist and Zionist. Britain responded with a drastic and perhaps even more traumatic decision. They moved all Jews out of Abraham City for security reasons. Then, in 1967, after the Six-Day War, a group of Jews decided to settle in Hebron again. But this time, they had the army 
on their side. This marked the start of new class clashes which culminated in the bloodbath of February 26, 1994 when Baruch Goldstein, 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 a Jew, opened fire on a group of Muslims who were on their way to the tomb of patriarchs to pray. About 60 people died on that occasion, including the 29 people that Goldstein killed and other victims of violence which followed. The Hebron Massacre of 1994, as it's being, being called, marked the first serious stop to the peace process launched a month earlier before uh, with the Oslo Accords signed by Rabin and Arafat. The fear, therefore, is that tensions surrounding Abraham's tomb will yet again blow out the feeble flame of negotiations which resumed between Israelis and Palestinians just a few weeks before that, back in late August of this year. Friends, brethren, a friend sent me this note saying that Islam and Catholicism are both going to play a very large part in the events of the age in the end of this age. There is, you know, the end of this age being the end of this society as we know it, uh, just before Jesus Christ and as Jesus Christ returns. His note says, there is coming a king, a kingdom of the of the south, the king of the south. Uh, Daniel mentions this in the prophecies. That kingdom, because the adherents of Islam control most of that part of the world, is likely to be an Islamic caliphate, according to my friend. And spiritually speaking, let's call the king of the south uh, Egypt, as many have in the past thought would be the king of the south, and though it may not be uh, confined literally to Egypt as a country, when God says Egypt in the Bible, he often means that which typifies sin. And so Egypt means, uh, and, and Egypt in the sense of our talk today means the descendants of Ishmael, which whom God blessed to be twelve princes, twelve rulers, Twelve sheiks, again like the sheik of Arabic. Nonetheless, Ishmael was not considered to be the le legitimate son of Abraham. N now I say that, I know some of you will argue certain things in the Bible because God honored and paid homage to Ishmael and to uh, Hagar and made him have twelve princes and be a great nation. But when God speaks of his legitimate son, he names Isaac as a legitimate son, and that means the other son was not the legitimate son. But nonetheless, um, like an adopted son, he, he was of the loins of Abraham and a, and a son. Uh, and uh, they themselves and the Arabs are the keepers of this burial place of Abraham and Sarah in Hebron. Daniel tells us that at the time of the end, the king of the south will push at the king of the north. Who are the Arabs? The king of the south. The Arabs will push against the king of the north, which is a united Europe. And that action will bring on a war heating up to the battle of Armageddon. Daniel 11, verses 40 through 45. We're also given to understand that the Roman Catholic Church, as the great whore of Revelation chapter 13, will play a very large role in the events of the end of this age. She is going to mount the beast power, king of the north, and guide that power into the destruction of the world as well as into its own destruction at the hands of Gog and Magog, a Gog and Magog coalition of nations, uh, Ezekiel 38-39. That coalition of nations will include China, Russia, Iran, and many other allied 
countries allied with them. Both the Muslim religion and the Christian religion in the form of the Roman Catholic Church will, along with the, the Church of God, play a very big role in the things that are about to happen in the world shortly. Some of you have been writing me showing some confusion about that, and that's why I'm studying this both in terms of the present world news and what God has revealed and taught by his faithful servant Herbert Armstrong and those who worked with him, such as Gene Hogberg and others, many others, with information God gave us through the work that God did through Mr. Armstrong that relates to the present news today. Now, friends, I've got to head off to a funeral. Thanks for joining me today. I'll be back on the live video channel called Nightcast Sunday night and back here again with you next Sabbath, God willing, and the creek don't rise. Have an edifying and a great Sabbath today, brethren, and a wonderful week ahead. So long till next time.